Listen, I wouldn't ask you to come here if I was wishing that you were on mute. Trey, we're very excited to, to have you with us. And I feel like I don't know where the time goes, but it just goes from one moment to the next. And then it's Thursday again. Oh my gosh. So the last few weeks seem that Thursday has definitely come um, quicker than normal, um, but we're happy about it. It's boiling hot here in London. So uh, for anybody, if anybody's with us in South Africa, it's actually freezing cold. I think it's just how we feeling like it is um, preparing us for Mashiach coming to greet us in Eretz Israel in this weather. And we're happy with that one. So we're looking forward. And thank you as always, Adel, for just saying, yes, sure, let's learn, let's go. Okay. Right. Okay, I have to tell you, by the way, you should know there's a Sparna in Parshas Nayach um, that says that when Mashiach comes, they won't, we won't have this like horribly hot summer and freezing cold winter. It's going to be springtime the whole time. So yeah, so I, I thought you'd like that one. Springtime, here we go. Okay, advance apologies, ladies. This is going to be slightly quicker than usual this evening. I have to just pick somebody up later on. Um, so we're going to see how far we get with this week's parasha. It is it's one of those very, can you hear me okay? I feel like- Yeah, I'm we can hear you and it's gorgeous. And we still do, will do our uh, parasha scala, but it is a gorgeous parasha. So we can't miss it. Let's go. No, you can't. It's actually all, you know, it's like one of those like stories and you get all the like, old stories and you get all the quotes and you're like, oh, that's where that quote comes from. It's uh, like everything, not everything, obviously the Torah is full of stuff, but a lot of the things that, you know, we think we know and we like, you know, and the stories we've heard, a lot of it comes in this parasha. So- I was kind of like a child in a sweet shop, you know, like, which one are we going to do? And I thought I'm going to try it like a kid in a sweet shop to try and get as many in as possible, because, you know, that's how we go. But I'm going to start off with a story. I did actually share this story with um, a share last week. So if you if you heard that share last week, I'm really sorry, you get it again. And it's also a very popular story did the rounds a couple of years ago. It's in Rabbi Bess's book on Nishmas, and it's one of my faves. So I'm going to tell it to you anyway. And it's about a lobster. Okay, here we go. Here's the lobster story. So this is a story of, um, no, sorry, it's a true story of a young man who um, came from a very um, a Hasidish home somewhere in America. Don't ask me where, which part of New York it is. I don't do New York. And he lived there and he was in contact with um, a chap called Rav Mota. And Rav Mota is what they call a mashpia, which is he's, he, in, these days we have influencers or influencers online, but he's like a traditional influencer, meaning he walks around and influences people and he tries to, you know, and people ask him questions about how they should live and what they can do better. And, and he's very, very good with um, young men, young teenage men, young Bahram. And one day, one of these um, young boys came to, young men came to him, what, 18, 19, and he said, Mata, I've got a halachic question for you. He said, here's my question. In our Hasidus, in our in our sort of in our style of Judaism, we have a very long shalashidas. Our Rebbe makes um, the third meal of Shabbat. He makes and he goes on and on. It's a very very long meal. So it starts in the afternoon and it goes on way into the night. So here's what I do: Shabbat afternoon, my father goes off to the Rebbe, and I take my father's car keys. This is Shabbos afternoon. I take my father's car keys and I drive to Long Island, which is you know quite an upmarket area, and I go to an upmarket restaurant with a couple of friends in my father's car. And we get lobster. I love lobster. It's my favorite food. I think it's amazing. We get a lobster. Like, you're looking horrified over there. Good. Right. You get, yeah. I get, I, I order lobster and I sing the, the, the traditional songs of Shabbat afternoon of Shalash and, um, and we sing the songs. And when we see it's getting dark, um, we drive back again. I get back well before my father gets home. I hang up the car keys where they are. He makes up. Nobody knows any different. So Rav Mata's trying very, very hard not to do what you lot are doing, which is wincing. So um, he, and he says, so what's your question? Yeah, I said, here's my question. I love lobster. It's just amazing. Um, by the way, ladies, do you know how you cook lobster? I will tell you, I hope, stop eating because you're going to throw up. Okay, here's, what you, here's what's going to happen, right? You take the live lobster and you stick it head first into boiling water. That's why people say red as a lobster, right? And then until it's dead and then you eat it. Okay, so... He says, here's my question. I love lobster. And I want to make a bracha. I want to say the bracha of shahakal. Can I make a bracha of shahakal on this lobster? Says Rav Mata. No, you can't really. You can't make a bracha on something that's not kosher. It's, you know, unless you've got, you know, if it's kukuach and nefesh, right? If it's, to save, if it's to save you because, you know, God forbid someone's ill, they have to eat something different. But you can't do that. But here's what you can do. You always go, go and order a glass of water, you know, from the tap. You take your water. And you make a shahakal, and before you make a shahakal, you say, Hashem, I really want to thank you for the lobster. 
But Rav Moshe says, I can't thank you for the lobster. So I'm going to make a shahakal on the water and I'm going to have the lobster in mind. So that's what he did. Now, I have a problem with these stories because the ones that they tell you always end up with this happy ending that, you know, five, ten years later, he turns up and he comes back to Rav Mata and he's back in the fold and he's, you know, he's obviously, you know, got himself back on the straight and narrow and all the rest of it. And we know that sometimes that doesn't happen just because someone says I'm beautiful. Sometimes you have to wait 10 years, 20 years, 30 years till, you know, we get to the world to come before we see the impact of our actions. But in this particular case, because it's one of those stories, Rav Mata did meet the young man, you know, several years later, and he had given up his um, interesting, dissolute ways of, you know, eating non-kosher and not breaking, breaking Shabbos and the rest of it. And he was, you know, very back to normal observant Judaism. And Rav Mata asked him what happened. And he said, this is what happened. He said, I got there and I, got, I was about to say the Shahakal and my friends thought I was mad. They said, look, you've driven on Shabbos. You've stolen your father's car keys effectively. You're eating lobster, which is several different, you know, negative commands all at once. And you're going to worry about making shahaka. And something about that kind of, well, obviously it matters and obviously it makes a difference. And even though I've got everything else a little bit wrong, this little piece is a piece where I can grow and go, made a difference to him. And once he'd done one thing, he sort of started to develop that. Well, if I'm going to say shahaka, I may as well do it. And he sort of grew from that back to where he, he should have been. And I love that story. Lots of reasons. One of them is the millions and millions of different morals and different shirim you can build on it. But I'm going to take one little bit. That shahaka that he wanted to make, it was such a little thing. But once he'd done that, once he'd done that little thing, it's able for him to sort of to grow and to go. So how does it work? Let's look at the mechanism. There's a, a concept we have, um, we have in Pirkei Avot, in, in the Ethics of the Fathers, called mitzvah gareres mitzvah. One mitzvah kind of causes another mitzvah. Two ways you can understand that. One, you can say it works like a kind of a reward system. It's a bit like, um, well, forget today's economy, like back in the days when we had a decent economy, right? You would have money in the bank, you would get interest on the money. And if you leave the interest in the bank, you then get interest on the interest and then interest. So it kind of like grows as it goes along. It's sort of, you know, cumulative, that's the word. It gets cumulative. So you do one mitzvah and you kind of get another one as well. And then they all kind of expand on each other. And that is true. And that's definitely one way of looking at it. On a deeper level, uh, and I'm going to tell you another story, actually. It's story day today. I don't know why I'm feeling very story-ish today. So this is another one. It's a story of back in many, 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 many years ago. You might have heard of Duff Yomi. Got a lot of publicity. It was a big, big CM not long ago. So the idea is that any, wherever you are around the world, if you are, you're learning Gugamara and anybody, you know, anybody and somebody would meet, they would be able to discuss the same page. It's a very big thing. But the person who... Um, invented, created the idea, Rameer Shapiro also built a big yeshiva and he decided, uh, very unusually in those days, he wanted it to be a very imposing building. He wanted to inspire people with, you know, the, the benefits of learning so they would treat it, you know, with importance. And at the end, he managed to get a donor, whose name I've totally forgotten, to give quite a lot of money. And at the opening ceremony, when everyone's, you know, praising this donor for, you know, giving all that money, one of the assembled Rabon in there said, you know, I'm quite in a nice way, jealous, jealous of him. And one and the person that said, I wish I could remember who I said, you, you, are you jealous of this donor because he's got such a big merit in building a sheep? He said, no, no, I'm not jealous of that. I'm, I'm jealous of whatever mitzvah he did that gave him the merit to do the next mitzvah of building this yeshiva. Okay, that's, that's how it's working. So whatever you're doing is giving you the next merit. Okay, lovely. Even deeper, let's have a look a bit deeper. Anashama, our soul is infinite. You can't measure it. What we can do in terms is expand how much access we get to it. So every time we do a mitzvah, which comes from the word to connect, we're connecting up out there. And each time it's kind of like expanding a muscle. You're giving yourself more space. So obviously, if you've expanded the amount of space your neshama is taking up, it doesn't take up space because it's not physical, but the amount of physical energy your neshama is using, the more you can expand that, the more you can then do with it. And that's how it works along. So the more capacity we have for doing something, the more we're going to be able to do, just like building a muscle. And one of the first things we see in this week's parasha, I told you there's a lot in it, and it's really pick and mix this week, is some, it's about Pesach Sheni. Okay? And that's a really good example of how once we expand ourselves a little way and expand our vision a little way, we can get more and more out of it. So Pesach Sheni, what happens? Along, there's, they're having Pesach and in the desert, in the Midbar, as they're traveling to Israel, and you, they have a korban, they have a sacrifice. And you cannot bring Karban Pesach unless you're something called Tzachar, which is 
translated as pure it's a terrible translation i'm not having tahar means um in a state of um i hate the word purity spiritual openness whatever it happens to be you have to be tahar and if you have been in close contact with um a dead body for example you've been at a burial or something like that then you are not you cannot then bring a carbon with the jewish people they were carrying the coffin of yosef right of joseph so the people who had very kind, and it's a very big mitzvah because they were taking him to be buried in Eretz Israel. And they would volunteer to do this mitzvah and they're carrying this coffin. And now comes along Pesach and they can't make the Karban Pesach because they are not Tahar, they are Tame from carrying the thing. And they went to Moshe Rabbeinu and they said, look, you know, we're a bit stuck over here. You, they actually went to Moshe and Aaron and they said, it says, Anu tume, anach, I'm reading, Anach nu tume, and we are Tame, right? Why should we be at a disadvantage? Why should we be worse off because we're not making the sacrifice? Svarna says a very interesting thing. He says, what's the question? The question is, we've just done a mitzvah and we know the more, it's quite a self-sacrificing mitzvah. You're schlepping this heavy coffin through the desert. It's not exactly, you know, well, there's easy mitzvahs, right? There's the ones we like and there's the ones that are a bit tougher. And this is a toughie, right? Really, really hard. And now you're telling us we're extending ourselves so much to do this mitzvah. And now you're telling us that because of that, we're going to lose out, not physically, spiritually. It doesn't make sense. You've always said it works the other way around. Moshe Rabbeinu says, a really good question. I'm going to go and ask Hashem. Now, Rashi, by the way, we'll get back to this, says, that is so interesting. He just like, like I would go, oh, I want to, you know, like you would say, I don't know, I want to know something. I'd go and look it up. He just goes and goes and talks to Hashem. Like you might pick up the phone to a friend and say, can you tell me a recipe? That, that's quite a close relationship. But he, Hamashi says, I'm going to go and ask Hashem. Here's the question. What, Hashem didn't think of this? Hashem gave us the Torah and he, what, he said, oh, he's, he's not up there in Shema. I'm going, oh, whoops, I forgot about that one, right? That can't be right. Can't be what happened. Hashem waited when he gave Moshe the instructions. He waited for those people to come and ask so they would have the benefit of the next merit, which is teaching something new to Klal Yisrael. And the new thing we've learned is that you always have a second chance. Right? Okay, you miss it this time, Hashem will give you another chance. You miss it that time, Hashem will give you another chance. There's always another chance, another way to expand ourselves, to expand our, our inner selves. But it's not that Hashem had oh, forgotten about it. He's waiting because these people have this mitzvah of carrying Yosef, which they've really extended themselves. It's a very difficult mitzvah. They've gone outside of themselves. And because they've extended themselves that much, they then get the additional merit of all the various, and ever since then, any time when we're saying, oh no, I missed that mitzvah, but doesn't matter, Hashem will give me another chance. All those merits are coming because they've extended themselves in the first place. Now there is a flip side to that. What if you don't do it? We're gonna to get to that later. What if, you, what if you missed the boat? But let's have a look at this, okay? Let's go back to that thing we said about Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu just goes and, he says, I'll go and ask Hashem, right? Rashi says, it's like a student who goes and asks a teacher. I'm just gonna go and quickly ask, right? Let's put my hands up and ask. Talk to Hashem. Well, Moshe Rabbeinu obviously could. He could just go and have a quick chat. You know, Hashem, what do I do about this? It's an incredible concept. How come he can do this? It says the Torah a little bit later on. He says Moshe Anav Ma'id. He's very humble. Humble. Okay, let's get this straight. Okay, humble does not mean you walk around saying, "Oh, I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. I'm useless. I'm rubbish." We'll get to that. That's 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 not humble. That's that's copping out, right? That's trying to get out of things. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Don't ask anything of me. That's not humble. Well, it's not humble in a Jewish sense. When we say anav in the, in the Torah sense, it means we take our ego out of the picture. So yes, I might be great at this and wonderful at that and not so great at the other, but it's not about me. It's about what am I going to do with the talent and the opportunities that I'm being given. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu did. And because he can do that, because he's taking himself out of the picture, therefore he can talk straight to Hashem. Now we can't necessarily do that, but we can emulate the idea. If you're rich, that's an opportunity. If you're poor, it's also an opportunity. If you're talented at this, that's an opportunity. If you're not talented at that, if you can't do that, and we'll get to this a bit later, also an opportunity. So it's not about saying, I don't have any talents or about saying I don't deserve, which we'll get to later. It's about saying, well, this is what I've got. What am I going to do with it, right? So this could be an opportunity for a mitzvah. What am I going to do with it? It could be just something I have around the place, but everything, everything, ladies, look around you, you know, another time. What can I do with that pen? What mitzvah can I do with that pen? What can I do with those flowers? What can I do with this? It might not necessarily be anything spectacular. There's always something you can do with what you're given, okay? Whether it's good, bad, or neutral. And we see that in this week's parsha. I'm going to quote Robson Heller over here. A little bit late, just after that, actually. 
Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu to make two trumpets. Now these are very costly trumpets. They're made out of silver and they only get one use, well, possibly two. Moshe Rabbeinu is the only one who uses them and he's gonna use them to summon the people to gather together. And he's gonna use them to tell everyone to get going, right? So he has a, from Rosh Hashanah, you have different shofar blasts. So he does the same thing with his trumpets and he gets them, there's two trumpets. So he has someone to blow them. Okay, he has something called a tekiah, which is that long one you have on Rosh Hashanah, right? The tekiah is to gather everyone together. And the teruah, which goes da, 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 right, very short burst, is to tell everyone to get up and get going and get moving or to get ready for war. So, okay, so you've got the same kind of notes as we have on a shofar, but on a trumpet made of silver. And it's only my shofar who got to use those. All the other leaders after that, with the exception of King David, had to use a shofar. So if they wanted to gather everyone together, they would blow a blast on the shofar. If they wanted everyone to get going or to get ready for war, they'd blow the short blast on the shofar, but it'll be a shofar. Make sure only gets trumpets, right? And the trumpets are made of silver. Hold that thought a second. Let's go a little bit deeper, okay? When you've got gathering together or moving off, they can be seen as two totally different ways of doing things, okay? One is very bad, we're gathering together, we're very connected, we're very together, it's all very nice and fluffy and wonderful, okay? That's, that's gathering them together. We have another one, right? The da -da 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 -da, the alarm sounds moving off, going to war, which sounds very yeah. much about separation, not so positive, yeah, not so yeah. lovely. Off we go, right? You know, we, 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 we move, 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 moving away and moving out, okay? And it is quite, you could see these, in fact, we tend to, see them as totally different aspects of the world. This one's good, this one's not so good. This one's about being close and in harmony. This one's about being split, split up and you know fighting or whatever else we're doing. In fact, deeper, here we go, right? The teller points out this, we have different names for Hashem in the Torah. One of those names is the one we spell with the Yud and a He, and that is a sign of Hashem's togetherness. Another of the names is the name Elay Kim, which is the one we use when we see something as being a sign of Hashem's we call it justice, that sort of maybe separation, not so quite connected. That name, L.A. Kim, is named of, made of two things. It's named of, made of, sorry, the Yud and then the He, which is the sign of connecting to Hashem. And the letters around it, Aleph, Lamad, and Mem, which mean mute, right? That when somebody can't talk, like when I was muting myself before, that would be Elaine, okay? So that's it. When we see, when we see, it's very easy, we think, right? We'd like to look for Hashem's mercy. When we see something that looks like separation from Hashem, that looks like it's severe injustice, what it is, is Hashem, it's just, we're not hearing him. We're not actually getting in there. That's how we see it. But if you're Moshe Rabbeinu, you don't see it like that. If you're Moshe Rabbeinu, you have two trumpets made of the same material, the silver, and I think I've shared this before on here. Every, every, everything entire, everything Hashem made is there to teach us something. The metal gold is like fire. That symbolizes din, judgment, right? It's quite harsh. It burns everything up, right? Okay. The metal silver is always, is similar to the sort of color of water, I guess, kind of vaguely, right? Okay. Silver is, is there of the, of, of, to, to symbolize Hashem's chesed. As far as Moshe Rabbin is concerned, everything is Hashem's chesed. And the Rekhanati points out, if you would look in the Pasuk, which I have in front of me somewhere here, the word trumpets is spelt with one of the letters missing. So it kind of looks like, even though it's trumpets, it looks like it's trumpet, okay? It's got a vav missing. Why? Because as far as my showing is concerned, if you take yourself and what you want and what you need and what you think out the picture, okay, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a high level. It's high level for me. You might all be very holy. I can't do this. But if, right, if you can take what we think it should be like out of the picture, then everything is a way of connecting to Hashem. The problem comes is when we got this picture, which I'll get to in a second, this idea in our heads of, of what it should look like or what it could look like or what would happen if we did it differently, okay? We see what, it's, what, what happens when it goes wrong. We also see in this week's parasha, how am I doing good? Okay, so a little bit on the parasha, just after that, right? We see what happens when we, we go to the other extreme. My Shabbat is one extreme. It's very, very hard, possibly impossible, very hard for me at least to get to the level where my Shabbat is, right? On the other extreme, we see a few for him later. It says the people were complaining. They slept through the desert and they start complaining. They're complaining. The pastor Hebrew word is that is misainanim, right? They're complaining. Interestingly, actually, pastor doesn't say they were complaining. He says they were like, the pastor says they were like complainers. They're ch misainanim. Rashi tells us that's because they, they weren't actually complaining. They just kind of almost felt like this is a place to be complaining. They, there wasn't a specific complaint. There's just a bit of a fetch. 
but this is a place to be complaining. Why do we complain? All right, I'm gonna to talk to myself, all right? Why do I complain all the time? Why is it we always, I always feel like, you know, it's like the Jew, they call it the Jewish woman martyrdom competition, right? Oh, I was up all night cleaning for Pesach. And this, how's your Pesach cleaning? Oh my God, I did this, I did that, I did the other. I folded 75 piles of laundry and then it cost this. I don't know why we do this, but we do. It's almost like you have to have this competition to see who is suffering the most doing this. I don't know what, we just did, right? Some people don't, but a lot of us, so this I said, I'm talking to myself. A lot of us do feel like we need to, to make it very clear to everybody how terribly hard it is. I don't know why we do that. One possibility is because we honestly truly feel like if we say it's going great, we're going to upset somebody, right? If I say, yes, I had a wonderful time and pace cleaning was really easy and everything was, then someone else who is not as fortunate might feel bad. And that is quite worthy. But sometimes, sometimes underneath that is this feeling that I've got to complain. I can't possibly say it's all good because I don't deserve it to be all good. And because I don't deserve it to be right, it's easier for me to complain now than wait for things to go wrong. Oh, it says my internet's unstable. Hmm, okay, right. Um, Rabbi Jacobson has a story, apparently it's true, of a chap who wanted to get rid of a fridge. He bought a new fridge. He has an old fridge to get rid of. It's in perfect working order. So um, he decided he would lay that outside his, uh, he didn't want to pay for it to get chucked, to, to towed away. So he left it outside his apartment building, again in New York. And he, and he put on the front, fridge, perfect working order, free to give away. And next day it was still there. And the day after it was still there. And the week after it was still there. And, you know, he was getting sort of nasty comments from the neighbors. So he had a brilliant idea. First thing he did is he went down in the middle of the night and he kicks the side really hard. So there's a really good dent in it. Okay. The next thing he does is he puts a sign on the fridge saying fridge $400. And within an hour it had gone. Somehow or other, if something's free, and in good condition, we feel like, well, maybe I shouldn't have this. Maybe I don't deserve it. Where's the catch? Something's bound to go wrong. It cannot be that something's going to be okay. So I have to go and find a reason why it's not okay. So you see, we, we go two directions. Sometimes we're trying so hard to, you know, to make it okay when it isn't. And sometimes we're trying to make hard to make it not okay when it is. But in a way, we can say it's all coming from the same place. You know, it's about saying what I think it is or isn't. That is my feelings and that's very valid and that's very nice but the point actually is what am i going to do with it now now i've got it now i've got the situation what am i going to do with it? you know i took um a while back i took my daughter for a you know back in the covid vaccination days and we all queued up and got you know got vaccinations and things right probably still are so i took her and i heard this and um she was a bit nervous and um the nice lady said to her it's okay to be not okay i thought such a nice line it's okay to be not okay Right. And it can also be the other way. Around. It's OK when things are not OK. And it's also OK when they are OK, because actually everything's coming from the same place. And the idea is that what we're going to do, what we're going to do with it is decide how am I going to deal with this? Right. There's a couple of ways you can deal with them. OK. One of the things you can do is the what we call the it could be worse syndrome. And again, we see how the misogynists kind of don't do that. Right. The people who are complaining start complaining about what they haven't got. They say, let's go back to Egypt. In Egypt, we had cucumbers. In Egypt, we had leeks. They, they name a whole load of, you know, lovely vegetables and things they used to have in Mitzrayim. But also the truth is, if you looked at the other way around, you would have said, well, also in Egypt, you're also slaves and you got whipped and you got beaten, you got tortured. So one way to deal with this, well, how do I deal with this situation is to say, well, nah, it could be worse. And that is definitely better than nothing. The problem with it could be worse. Okay. The problem with it could be worse is um, actually, I actually had this conversation with a friend of mine the other day. She, you know, we were talking about getting your kitchen done and getting your kitchen changed over. And the fact that at one point I'd had to sort of live in my in one room in my, you know, one room in downstairs in my house with a little camping stove, and she'd had to leave in one room with, you know, her mother, mother-in-law's takeaway. But then we said, well, you know, but at least we've got an upstairs, and at least we've got a bedroom, and at least we've got somewhere for the kids to go, and so and so and so forth. And then she says something worse. She said it's very wise. She said, you can say, okay, it could be worse. But the drawback of that is it's a little bit insensitive, even when you're saying it to yourself. Because if I'm used to one thing and then I don't have it, for me, that's going to be very hard, right? We actually have a halach about that. If a rich, per if a poor person needs tzedakah and needs a roof over his head, and a person who used to be rich needs charity, needs a roof over himself, you give each of them what they were accustomed to. 
you can't say, well, just be happy with what there is. It could be worse. So it could be worse is a very good way of dealing with difficult things, but it's not, it's, it, it's, it's got its disadvantages. Another way we can do is say, well, let's appreciate what we do have. Okay, so I don't have, in their case, they don't have cucumbers and leeks and fish and things, but I do have the mud and I do have the this and I do have the that. Definitely a better one. I don't, I might not have, um, I might not have a Mercedes, but at least my car's working, right? I might not have a palace, but at least I've got a roof over my head. Definitely better, okay? Because then at least I'm seeing what there is rather than just what, what seeing what there isn't. Highest level of all, okay? I'm going to tell you a story. Now, I think to appreciate this story, you have to have been a child in the, a child in the 1970s listening to non-Jewish music. So if that does not apply to you, you'll have to take, take my word for this one. I was not a child in the 1970s. Well, I was, but a very, very little one, right? So I'm going to tell you a story that is actually from the 1950s, and it's about um, a small town. I'm telling a lot of American stories today. I don't know why. Um, there's a, a small town somewhere in America. Don't ask me where. I will look it up if you want to know. And it's a little, one of those little sort of one room village school kind of things. And the kids, all, all of a sudden the kids yell. Why do they yell? There's a mouse. And the mouse runs across the room and it's like, ah! like you know, it's like a mouse. And the teacher's pretty scared too. And all of a sudden they, they know the mouse is there and they can hear it pattering around. But they can't see it. It's under their feet. It's over here behind the table. It's under there, whatever it is. It's, it's, it's all over the place, right? It's running around. And the teacher says, looks at a kid in the back row. She says, Stephen, she says, I want you to find the mouse and Stephen doesn't move and he doesn't move his head and he sits there and he says miss it's under the table about four whatever is five inches to the right of where of where I am and six inches to the front and, as, and the teacher says Steve, Stephen she says I know you could do it I knew because of your incredibly developed sense of hearing that you would work out where that mouse is when we couldn't see it he said Stephen come up stand up I want to give you a clap and Stephen takes his white stick because he was blind and he sat or well, partially sighted and he stands up and everyone gives him a clap. I'm gonna tell you about that, Stephen. He grew up to become a very famous soul musician. Again, not my, not my era, but he became a very famous musician called Stevie Wonder. So if that's your past, then you'll know exactly who he is. Yeah, okay, right. And that is, that is him. So what happens with him? He didn't say, oh, well, it could be, nobody said, oh, well, it could be worse. At least you can hear, right? Nobody said even, well, okay, so you can't see, but you can hear. What's happening here is because you can't see, therefore you can hear better, and therefore you have that talent, okay? It's, it's almost the same, but it's slightly different. Is This is what you've got. What is that talent? What is that opportunity? And obviously he went on and became a, a, a very famous musician. So that is, I'm just very mindful of the time, sorry, ladies, but this is, this is where we're coming from, okay? We can be like like the trumpets okay we can be like the people who carry joseph we can say look this is what there is is it easy it might be doesn't matter it might be there's nothing wrong by the way with it being easy okay let's get this straight we're not you know one of these religions that says you've got to suffer and be miserable all the time if it's easy that's great thank you Hashem. right is it easy might be is it not easy might be was there anywhere in the contract that said it's it's better or worse if it's easy or not not really okay is it from Hashem? Yes. Is it good for me? Yes. I know it is. I might not remember. I might not feel it is because, you know, we are human beings and it's hard. So then what's my job? If I can see, sometimes it is easy, right? Don't knock, don't knock it being easy. If when it is good and it is easy and I can see the opportunity for connection with Hashem, fabulous, wonderful, amazing. Thank you, Hashem. This, I'm going to grow and do as much as I can from this. Okay. What if I, what if I can't see it? That's also okay. It's also silver. It's also from Hashem. I'm going to see what I can do with this one. Okay, so this is not about a competition between who's got it worse. Okay, I know we sometimes, you know, we have these stories about this person suffered and it wasn't it went and they did great. And it's very nice and it's very admirable and we should look at it. But if you've got it easy, that's also okay, right? It's okay to be okay and it's okay to be not okay. But the, the idea is that whatever we get is from Hashem. And if we can take, and that includes, by the way, personal characteristics, okay? So if I am struggling with, you name it, this is random, okay? Getting out of bed, one of these people who get, really struggles to get out of bed in the morning, right? If I am one of these people who really struggles not to gossip, if I'm a person who really struggles not to get angry, that's from Hashem, because I'm going to use it to expand and grow. 
if I'm one of these people who finds it incredibly easy to jump out of bed, I find it incredibly easy to get through a whole book of Tehillim and all my dampening, you know, straight away. I find it incredibly easy not to gossip. If, if you're that person, please come and talk to me because I'd really like to know how you do it. Okay, but whatever it is, if easy, then that's also from Hashem and that's also okay. What am I going to do with it? How am I going to use this to expand my outlook and expand that muscle for Neshama and not close it? And I want to just finish off with sharing you something which is actually nothing at all to do with Jewish. It's an analogy somebody sent me today about English writing, okay, and I'm going to adapt it because it's just such a nice analogy. I'm going to adapt it to, to our growth through the day, mainly because it came my way this afternoon when I was wondering what I was going to say to you, and I thought, okay, this is what I'm like. Okay, so he compares he compares the job of an art, how an architect does things to a gardener. So if you're an architect, right, you do your planning, and I once worked for an architect. The amount of planning time that goes into things is huge, it's massive, right? Take out, you, you might even get half the job done the way you wanted to do, but you know, every single thing is detailed. What you're making the bricks, what you're making the windows of, where's everything, where's the radiators, where's the pipes, but little details, where is the nail going to go? You don't even start until you know exactly where every last piece is going to go. And you can try and live your life like that. Some people do. Some people get up in the morning and their day is planned, right, to the last nail, the last screw, the last everything. This is how it's going to go. Now, I have to tell you, I've worked for an architect. You can plan it as much as you like, right? But the finished building isn't always the way you wanted it to go. But you could do that. You can try and plan it. People do that with their time. And if you can do it, great, right? People do that with their money, lots of things. A go when you go in the garden, right, and you take a seed, and I'm getting old. The reason I know I'm getting old is because I'm getting into gardening now. Apparently, it's a sign of getting old, right? I don't know what it is, but, you know, like I say. So you go in the garden and you plant your seed or you plant your bulb or whatever else it is. You know what it's supposed to be, right? You look at the seed packet and it says it's going to look like this. It doesn't, right? But you plant it and then you go away and you've no idea. Even if it will be like Jack the Beanstalk and it would grow overnight. When you put that seed in, you've no idea how it's going to go. But you just trust that whatever's going to come out is going to be something nice. You have to water it. You have to make sure it gets sunshine. Sometimes the weather is way too wet and you weren't expecting that and you have to do something about it quick, quick, quick. But all the time you're adapting to whatever is happening in the garden so this seed is going to grow. And I mean, again, he was this person who sent this was talking about English writing, but I think it's a really nice analogy for us. So I'm going to leave it with you. Okay. If I wake up and I say my da'ani and I'm trying to plan my day, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and this is how I'm going to make it work, you can try and do that, but it's, it's, it's quite a difficult pressurized way to live. If I can say, look, I'm planting the seed this morning. I'm starting with my da'ani. I'm thanking Hashem for waking me up. And whatever comes my way, I am going to try my best to make that an opportunity for growing. That is hopefully a much more peaceful way of living. Definitely helps us expand. You know, I say expanding on Hashem. It's not a good way of putting it. Expand ourselves, expand our connection with Hashem. And if I believe in myself enough, and if I believe that Hash enough that Hashem loves me and is tending me like a plant in the garden, then I can go through the day just seeing what comes along, seeing what I've got, and using that as an opportunity. So I'm going to wish you a wonderful Shabbos. Rebbe Dov, I know you're doing your half rushes now, but I actually have to run. So I'm going Gorgeous. to wish you a run. wonderful Shabbos. I hope Thank you. In Merz Hashem, we will all plant lots of seeds. Amen. We will learn all the lessons of humility. We will try and put everything into um, living life. And you disappear. And I'm going to be back. It's with nice you to see you, ladies. Give me one minute, okay? One minute.